Hello. So today, Sanatan and I are going to both cover a couple little features. Uh, some of it's going to be common to some of you guys, some of it will be brand new. Uh, essentially, most of you that I see, good, good to see you again, haven't seen you in a while. Most of you guys were here this session. We talked a little bit about footwear when uh, Martin came with Softstar and the other shoe companies came as well. A little bit of that is going to be a recap of what we're going to talk about today, but instead of just talking about um, you want a flat shoe that doesn't have a heel and doesn't have a toe spring and doesn't have a taper, we're going to talk about what do you do since most of us have been in those positions for most of our lives. It's a rare individual that I meet that hasn't had decades of this going on on their feet. There is one person I know, in fact many of you people here know of him, he sometimes comes to the group. His name is Daniel Martinek. He's a barefoot runner. He races barefoot. And the thing about Daniel that I find very compelling and very interesting about this conversation today is Daniel took pictures of his feet over the last year and a half to two years, and I think you might have put it up on the Minimalist Monday blog, yeah. which shows that much of what we are going to talk about today does not necessarily need any fancy aids to accomplish that. We're going to talk about some fancy aids today, but what Daniel proved was all he did is he took off his shoes, he took his time, and he watched his feet change. And what I find most compelling about Daniel is his big toe position. You notice that when he first took his shoes off, his big toe is like most people's big toe, is close to his second toe. A year and a half later, after not having any shoe on his toe that pushed his toe over, it was remarkable the change that had taken place. So the point is, much of what we're going to talk about today can take place just by making good decisions, but a lot of us are going to also be motivated to, to help accelerate the process, especially if you're folks like Sanatan and I, Elizabeth's going to be going into medicine here shortly too, so we want some aids to help people get through these problems. So just a really brief recap, you'll recall, I think it was week two, we talked about the three inherent design features that we want to try to avoid at all costs, and we'll briefly touch on those today. Up until recently, everything had a two to one heel to four foot ratio. The heel was higher than the four foot. Up until recently, nearly all the running, walking, hiking shoes had a rigid toe spring where the end, of the, the end of the shoe goes higher than the ball of the foot by about 25 degrees. And most significantly, all of the shoes for all of us for most of our lives have been widest at the ball and not widest at the ends of the toes. So recently there's been a change in the industry um, thanks to Softstar and some other forward-thinking companies. We're finally getting to shoes that don't harm people's feet. But let me just give you an example of somebody I saw in my clinic on Friday who has been doing this for a couple of years, but they went decades before they got on this program. And unfortunately, because of that, they're having a couple of issues. Several of you in the room have figured out it's not nearly as simple as just take your shoes off and everything's great, uh, which is part of the big reason why we put together this, this group, so that we can cover all the little pieces that create success. But the point was, I met a gentleman that about two and a half, three years ago, after 20 some years of going with conventional footwear, decided to go minimal or barefoot. And uh, wonderful choice, but the problem is many of us have developed uh, what I'll call deformities in our feet over the course of our lifetime that most Americans don't even consider to be deformities. As a matter of fact, when I, when I begin talking to patients in my clinic about how the toes are supposed to be the widest part of the foot, not the ball of the foot, most adult Americans look at me puzzled almost that that is a new piece of information for them. So what we want to talk about today is how do we um, how do we enhance the experience of getting to completely barefoot or getting to minimal without harming ourselves? Um, so there's three things I'm going to touch on and then I'm going to pass it on to Son. Son's going to talk about a little bit of things that are going to overlap in terms of the doming of the foot and so forth. It's great if you have a great therapist and you can come to the clinic, um, but there's often times where we might want to be doing some of this in our life and that's the piece that I'll talk about today. So let's assume You've come to Minimalist Monday, you really want to make this change in your life, you go out and you get yourself some minimal shoes and it's not going quite right. Um, there's, three feet, there's three real reasons why I think that happens for most people. And as we go through the series of 12, many of the classes will touch on these little pieces. But in my clinic and in the medical literature, for those of you that want to get geeky about this and read the studies about this, if you elevate your heel above your forefoot, there's a very good two-year-old study that shows that your Achilles tendon and calf muscles will get shorter by about 13%. That came out of the Journal of Investigational Biology. So as Sanatan and I go through the series where you need appropriate ankle dorsiflexion, you need to be able to do that with your heel on the ground, 
one of the major negatives of wearing the two inch heel or even a one inch heel is you will inhibit your body's ability to dorsiflex your leg over your ankle. So we can come to the gym or we can do eccentric drops, we can do the things that we were doing I think a couple weeks ago yeah. where we're on our toes on the waterfront dropping our heel. Um, all of those things are valuable and beneficial to reverse the elevated heel positions. In fact, women are going to have it way more than men. A yoga instructor was telling me recently when she has her clients uh, lean up against a wall and put their legs up in the air, the women's toes are always pointed up more than the men's because the women are in more of a high-heeled shoe. So even though it is a problem for guys and gals, it's, it's overwhelmingly a problem for women, which is why some of the companies want to make women's running and walking shoes with an elevated heel to accommodate the shortening that has gone on. Sonata, myself, and Aaron wish for you not to accommodate deformities, but to actually fix deformities. So getting into the flat shoe, doing your eccentric drops, doing some of the skills that we're learning here will mitigate that piece of it. The other piece of it, and the reason why this gentleman came into my clinic on Friday, was he spent an inordinate amount of time running and walking in the shoe with a big toe spring. So if you look in the medical literature and the study that's on our website from 105 years ago, there was an orthopedic surgeon that couldn't figure out why most of the patient's feet in his clinic and my clinic are like what my foot is being held in right now. Extensor contracture was what he called it. 1905 Journal of uh, Bone and Joint Surgery. This gentleman traveled throughout the world. He couldn't figure out why most indigenous populations, barefoot populations, had this position. Most of the patients in his clinic, particularly women, had this position. So to mitigate that, first step is go barefoot or get a shoe that lets your toes go flat. But the other piece that mitigates that is a stretch we call the toe extensor stretch. And you'll remember there is a section in the course where we talk about doing it like this. We also talk about running our ankle forward. The whole point is if you spend a great deal of time with your toes up in the air, they learn that and they're going to hold it like that and that's gonna keep you from having success in a shoe like this, or it's gonna keep sending you to, to our offices for, for, for problems. I'm gonna pass my shoe around. I've got a metatarsal pad in my shoe, which is one of my favorite ways of getting the toes back down on the ground. And Sonatan's gonna go over some therapy in a moment where you can do the same thing by doming your metatarsal arch on a ball. I love those techniques, but I also love for my patients to be able to put something in their shoe and spend part of their day with their metatarsal arch domed. If you look at how shoes have been built up until recently, most manufacturers thought people had a problem with the medial longitudinal arch, so we jacked a bunch of stuff up there. If you want my opinion, most runners and walkers have a problem with their metatarsal arch, which is this arch right here. It ends up being <coughs> um, deformed and depressed, according to what Dr. Rossi wrote, and those articles are on our website. So essentially, I see people who the central metatarsals get dropped down, the first and the fifth toe come in, and that's basically their foot. So between the stretch, um, I also like to put a metatarsal pad in there. So I'm going to pass my shoe around. That white pad is what a metatarsal pad looks like. So we've covered two of the three pieces, the dropping of the heel, the dropping of the toes. The third piece, perhaps, is my favorite piece, um, mostly because of the profound effect it has had on my own body and my own running. Uh, in 1999, I spent way too many years in a size 9 Nike running shoe that positioned my toes like that, and I ran miles and miles and miles. And eventually I got to the point where my second toe decided it was going to sit up on top of my big toe. And not so surprisingly, I spent too much time in the doctor's office with back pain and knee pain and cortisone and Advil and so forth. So the third piece that I feel very strongly about as an accelerator of these positive changes is called correct toes. And I designed this for my own deformity, basically. I started taking sil silicone splints and putting them here, putting them here. It started working pretty good, so I started putting them in between all my toes. I started telling my walkers and runners, we all experimented with that. At that point, we didn't have Merrill shoes, so we had to chop the shoes and stretch the shoes and relace the shoes. But if you were to talk to my wife who saw my deformed foot then and 13 years down the road, she would say, my foot changed. What's remarkable about this is if you get in the medical literature, you talk to a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors are going to tell you that's not possible non-surgically. Elizabeth is considering podiatry school. I'm, I'm thrilled at the amount of time that we've been able to spend in my office. She's seeing a whole other perspective. If you were to come see my staff, you would see a woman that has worked with us for a year had a bunion. It's almost reversed after a year. That's going to be on our Correctos blog. So the third piece is to 
recognize that if you want to have a healthy body, and notice I didn't say a healthy foot, I said a healthy body, you need to be thinking about your foot needs to be widest out here. Not 100% of the time for the gals that wonder how you're going to look pretty and dress up, that's, that's appropriate too. But for the majority of the time, you want to be thinking about positioning your foot like a natural human foot. And if I were to share with you guys what I've seen in the last decade with just these three simple things, I hardly prescribe medicines, I rarely give injections, I do zero surgery except minor surgery in the office. And that's not to say it works for everybody, um, and it's not to say it works 100% of the time permanently. I still suffer setbacks, which is one of the things I love so much about this class, is I get to learn new things too. Um, so those would be the three things I would encourage you guys to be thinking as ways of rehabbing your foot back to what nature intended for it to be. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about any three of those things, uh, either now or, or after Sonatan speaks. Make good sense? Yeah? Okay. All right, so. So Ray, do you wear those in your shoes? I do, I do. So if you yeah. have normal shoes, like. Won't work. It won't work, yeah. like for the women's, like, Shoes or something, it won't work. Typically not, and there's a couple ways of evaluating that. I don't have the little pamphlet that comes with the product. Probably Sonatan has one yeah. in one of the boxes, and I'll show it to you. Our best trick there is most shoes will have a removable liner, sock liner, insole. So the uh, best thing to do is pull that out, stand on it, and you want to see that sock liner all the way around your foot. These days, I'm really pleased to see that a lot of the minimal companies are not putting a sock liner in there which makes what we just talked about a little difficult. So if you're in the store and you want to use correct toes and you want to know if the shoe is going to accommodate it, you stand on the opposite shoe, full weight bearing, and you'll notice that the sole is right there and the sole is right there, which means that probably the shoe is not going to do anything negative to me. Now if I stood on this shoe, like a lot of the older Merrill products, most of my females' big toe will be there and their fifth toe will be way over here. That shoe would not be appropriate for this. 10, 15 minutes into it, you'd probably wonder what in the world we're thinking because your foot would hurt. So um, yeah, we, we, we like to get people to try to wear these as often as possible, but the typical female shoe, it's not going to work because the typical female shoe gets narrower, and that's what we like about it, which also is what brings people to my office. So it's hard to, I constantly say in the clinic, it's hard to look good in America and have healthy feet, um, which is why podiatry abounds. <laughs> that answer it? Yeah. Okay. Other, other questions? Other? Okay. So I'm going to pass it on to the master then. <laughs> um, that, was, uh, that was great. Um, so this, this natural foot position that, that, that he's talking about and these accelerators, what can we do to kind of help speed up this process that is, you know, from if somebody's lined up, they moved from Hawaii a year ago and they grew up there and it might be couple months or it might be a couple years or you know or however long it's a long period of time but what can we do to train ourselves as runners um, the book uh, that uh, that Ray's uh, correct those are featured in uh, um, Jay DeCherry anatomy for runners um, great book um, and one of the things I like about it best is it talks about looking at running and we focus on that here as a athletic pursuit a skill that we're trying to hone and that takes, if you play golf, you go to the driving range. It takes, it takes some work. You got, there's a little bit of pay to play. If you play basketball, yeah, you got to you know, work on your free throws. You got to work on your jump shot. Play soccer, you juggle the ball. You kind of work on your skills. You don't have to do those things, but you can't expect to get any better at them, right? Just playing the game. Running is really the same thing. It's like finding ways to work on your system. Um, and we're, we're, we're kind of working on the system from the, from the ground up. So um, some of these things, getting into these positions, uh, is you'll find some access to, uh, to how your foot and body should work. As you build this awareness, you'll start to see the difference and you'll start to see, God, every time I run with the correct toes, you know, maybe, if, try them out and see if this is a, maybe this is that 5% difference. If not, you can take them back, right? You take them back Absolutely. for 30 days or whatever. Yep, yep. Take them back and see and, and, and just do what we do and figure out what's best for you use your own body's intuitive sense, just like with your exercises and your running stride, and I kind of give you some guidelines and some things to tune into, but the final answer is what's going to be best for you on that given day, um, and, and, and to figure it out. So getting your foot in natural foot position is what we're trying to do, and I'll give you a couple things to kind of accelerate, and also to deal with some of the injuries that we oftentimes have. Um, whether you're running barefoot, you're running in shoes, whatever, or any activity, 
but especially something that's a repetitive motion activity, over 80% of the injuries it's estimated are from overuse or repetitive stress. Too much too soon on that particular tissue. So probably the most important thing you can learn, and anybody who's in here who's been my patient has, has heard me say this, is that paying attention to how things feel during the event, a few hours later, and then that next morning when you wake up relative to baseline gives you an idea of whether or not your body could deal with your stresses from the day before or whether or not that dosage was a little bit high and maybe I need to pull back a little bit. Stacking irritation on top of irritation is how tissue changes happen where we get these kind of plantar fasciitis things that you know that we need to kind of get in there and break up is this that repeated irritation before it's allowed to heal you kind of it's like another wave came and and knocked it down. That's where these long-term things happen hugely percentage of the time. So paying attention to that, where that body is at, where it feels that next morning gives you an idea of, oh, I stepped on a rock, ow, that hurt during, a few hours later, maybe I kind of felt it next morning, I felt fine. Well, I know I didn't do any tissue damage. Because if you did, it would have been inflamed all night and got kind of sore. So how it feels during, a few hours later, and that next morning, when you wake up relative to what your kind of moving average is, gives you a really good idea of how that dosage, running or walking or whatever it might be for you, how your body could, could deal with that. And pretty much the way to go wrong is to stack things up on top of themselves. And your, your body's system, that's why rule number two is walk or run in your own footsteps, is to figure out where your body is at, because your body and your body and your body is going to be at a different places, different times, even different weeks. So the more kind of in tune we get to that, the better luck we're going to be. Our, uh, the, first, the first thing I want to do is, um, is piggyback on what Ray was talking about on opening up the top of the foot um, with a ballet stretch, but add, it, add a, little, a little twist to it. So let's stand on up. So first one is here, OK? Um, so one people typically do is where they push their ankle forward. It's the big stretch. It's the toe extensor focus. Um, this stretches the toe extensors and, and also the toes themselves, but that big stretch there. And I don't know exactly what Ray tells his patients, but for my people, I usually say five plus minutes a day. I say five minutes to a half hour. So <laughs> you can do it while you're sitting at you're sitting at work. I think there's a lot of docile foot time while you're sitting on the computer doing email. Um, so the big stretch is this. You push forward, you feel that nice kind of taut tightness across the top of the foot. You may even be getting a little bit of cramping. The small stretch is where we drop the heel back a little bit. Careful with this in terms of pressure. You may need to hold on a little bit where you're going to focus more on the, on the toes. The tops of the toes getting flexion like knuckles across the tops of the toes. Be where you're at. Your big toe may not flex quite as much as your other toes, but by dropping that heel back, you'll feel it more localized to the capsules of the top of the toes. We'd like to see that we can bend those tops of the toes, you know, like look at Christy over here, about 90 degrees or so. <laughs> uh, it's a nice amount of flexion. You may have a little less on your, on your, big, on your big toe, but that's kind of what we want to do. Go back to, the, back to the, the large stretch, push it back. Now, I would recommend, yeah, do it, don't do it on a hard ground, right? You'll feel the tops of your feet. You don't want that to be a limiting factor. Put a towel down or at work, you're sitting down, you don't have quite as much pressure. But spending time in this position um, is important. Ray talked about the metatarsal pad, which supports under this part of the foot right here. And when you kind of flex your foot, you'll actually see almost what looks like a metatarsal pad right here. You have that kind of foot core. Um, it's where we kind of use these toe flexors to, that help arrange the bottom of the foot and help support our metatarsal arch. So active contraction in a shortened position is a good way to get our foot to be able to engage with the ground in this position. If it's used to being strong here, that's where, it, that's where it's used to being strong. And my foot used to be trying to figure out, like, you know, when I was in cleats all the time, it was all crowded together and popped up. We want it to be able, when it's flat on the ground, now can it engage with the ground? Can those toes engage with the ground in that position? So we exaggerate that position by going here into your ballet stretch, just gently. Keep your weight mostly on the other foot so you don't make your foot sore. And then try to actually curl your toes. And you'll feel some sort of deep contraction maybe in the bottom of your foot. So curl your toes, but also almost try to grab an apple with the arch of your foot right here. Almost imagine palming an apple. If it gets a little crampy, you can shake it out. Don't go right into this stretch if you can help it. Just work on relaxing that. Try that again. So from the ends of the toes, do this with your hands. Go like this. Everybody keep your hands nice and straight like this. And then let's kind of come, keep them straight and kind of come on down. 
Keep your fingers straight. Come down to this nice tight position right here. You should feel some contraction right in the center of your hand there. That's the same thing we're doing with our foot. Now curl right from the ends of the fingers. And now curl your ends of your toes. <laughs> so the contraction should be not just, not just, just the toes like this, but actually the foot and the toes centered right there. So while you're doing your ballet stretch, you're already, got, you're already doing it. Might as well add some contractions, maybe 50 a day, just on and off, on and off, so that your foot, if it can contract in that position, it can contract in this position on the ground. OK? Active contraction in that shortened position. A little self-test to see how your feet are, how strong they are in that shortened position, is to come down to kneeling. If, uh, if anybody has difficulty kneeling or sitting on their heels, um, we can generally provide a, a towel for you or something like that. But in this position, you're kind of in a ballet stretched position, OK? Move your, move your uh, hands back behind you and put your uh, finger, thumb fingernails onto the ends of your big toes. What's going on back there? Everybody find them? Get to there. And then go ahead and once you're in that position, then go ahead and give it a try to pull up and see how strong are those toes. How much can you lift them off the ground against, against resistance? It's like a self-manual muscle test. And relax. So, anybody getting cramping in their foot? If they do, they can just, you can either be, try to find it and lean on it, or come out of that position for a second and shake it out. Let's try going down each of your toes. Sometimes, I want, we'll, just, we'll just do a pull here, randomly. See if anybody gets a sense of which of their toes is kind of stronger or less strong. So let's go to the second toe, all right? Get the end of the second toe. Try to curl the end of the second toe off the ground. And relax. End of the third toe. End of the fourth toe. And fifth toe, pinky toe. All right. So if you're uncomfortable in this position, come out of the position. Um, so a lot of times people will have either kind of their uh, will have different parts of their foot that may be strong. Especially if I've, I've found that if people have that midfoot, that like second, third toe being kind of really weak or really having trouble kind of activating that, um, then they can work on this pro process. But in the meantime, you know, certainly a metatarsal pad can sometimes help um, when they're not working on it and they're just walking around. Um, you don't want to be tensing up your feet while you're walking. Remember, we leaf our feet. We do our work elsewhere and then, and then, uh, and then try to let our, let our let her body figure out the gait stuff. Um, so um, we're going to do the, quickly, we we'll do the kind of the ball release for the foot and then some stuff for, the, for your calves. So I want us all to get a foam roller. Um, I got a few of them over here. A half one will be fine. And then uh, grab, a, uh, grab a lacrosse ball. So foam roller, um, let's, let's try to be uh, uh, sort of specific on, our, on the things that we do with our foam roller, OK? A lot of times we can get up on here, just put, put one, one leg on there, whichever, whichever leg or calf you kind of want to deal with on your foam roller. Um, put that up on there. And here's a, here's a pretty simple way to kind of be a little more specific with our foam roller work. Okay, a lot of times we'll just kind of roll on here. And that's all well and good. Massage is always nice, right? Helps circulation, helps healing. So massage is always nice. Um, but let's just, I want you to kind of just take a survey, whether it be one leg rested on there or another one on top. Keep your foot kind of relaxed and flaccid and kind of pointed like you're leafing your foot. And then kind of roll up until you find a, a little bit of a tight sore spot. Start from the bottom and kind of, kind of survey in and out and just figure, and then whenever you find a kind of a little bit of tight sore for me right here, that's where I want you to stop. So once we find something that you would consider to relax with a little bit of a tight sore spot, everybody find anything yet? Okay, so now that we're on here, um, first thing we're going to do is we're just kind of just try to sink in and relax a little bit deeper in. Just let depth do its... So maybe that in of itself is going to help you kind of get to a little deeper. Now let's try to figure out what tissues are involved. There's a lot of tissues crossing over on the bottom of our calf down here. Um, and so what we can do is we can do a little bit of some selective tissue work. Keep your toes right where they're at and then just curl your toes back and forth. Just move in just your toes. If you feel what's going on underneath your calf moving, like that's getting my guy right in there, then do that. <laughs> then we may be on your uh, 
flexor digitorum or flexor hallucis, okay? If you're really silly, you can do one and then the other and see, God, maybe it's how those tissues are sliding by each other that I actually, I'm getting a little bit of interaction there. So go toes, now, now let's go ankle in and out. So if your tib post is involved, this may, which is one of the muscles in your deep calf, as you come in, this may, this may kind of, oh yeah, that works. If it doesn't do anything, then move on, right? Just treat what you got. So kind of go toes first, ankle in and out, and then go kind of ankle back and forth. And this gets into a lot of your flexors, but basically your soleus and your gastroc a little bit more. If that's your guy, that's the one to work on a little more. Does that make sense? So we have different muscles, and we can't just do one thing, but we can kind of be a little bit more specific if you have something that Oh, that keeps getting tight in the same way, you can kind of get those tissues to slide by each other potentially a little bit better. So you move on, find a spot, sink in. If one leg is too much where you can't, where you tend to be tightening up, don't add a second leg. But get on a spot, try just the toes, try the ankle in and out, and try it back and forth. And if none of those things seem to really change it that much, well, you can always go back to just rolling back and forth. That's all well and good. The last, the last element is the cross-fiber friction. So find your, find your spot. Um, we, uh, we worked it back and forth. Now let's just kind of shear back and forth like this. Keep your toes almost facing the same direction, but you're almost like trying to slide the tissues, kind of rolling those, things, those different layers on each other. It's a little less like this, it's more kind of sliding back and shearing back and forth. So with this little series, we get pressure in, we get kind of longitudinal um, release this way, relative motion, and we also get the different layers of the calf. You got your so gastroc, soleus, deep flexors, they're all kind of sliding by each other, and so we're releasing in lots of different ways. Um, and this is where a lot of times people emphasizing their calves a little bit too much, plus they gotta build up strength, plus they have shortened Achilles, where we get a lot of problems down here sort of first. A lot of the knees and hip stuff starts to feel quite a bit better when people go to a more minimalist route. But you gotta do the, you gotta do the maintenance, the pay to play. Athletes are doing this. Sometimes maybe if they're a pro athlete, they got a massage person doing this. If you guys can hire a daily massage person, cool. If not, um, you, can, you can do something like this to get some, get some release, okay? Um, you can just maybe be a little bit, a little bit more selective, a little smarter about it. When you're doing your, when you're spending time doing your rolling, does anybody have any questions about that? I know that was kind of quick, but so if you find a spot where moving your toes back and forth, you feel it there. Is this keeping up that movement, moving your toes back? And yes. Like so basically, with any of this stuff, you want to go until you get some sort of what you'd feel like a relaxation or a release. Okay, whether it's just pure pressure, whether it's kind of the frictioning thing, whether it's this thing, you kind of go until maybe the symptoms go down 50% from that initial bit. Okay, and then move on. Is there a certain amount of time you should do it generally, is just how you feel, or is it so, um, possible to do too much, I guess? That's not generally the, the issue that I see, is that people doing it too much. So if you spent two hours going like this on your calf, I would expect you to be kind of sore and bruised. You pay attention to how it feels during, yeah, a little bit sore, a few hours later, better, next morning better, that's good. If you followed our system and you, ah, that hurt during, then two hours later you're like, ah, I can hardly walk, and next morning you're like, are limping down the stairs, clearly the dosage was too high and you would pull it back just like you would with your running. You're just kind of paying attention to how your body reacts to it, and whether it was inflammatory or more of a release sort of thing. Okay? Um, any other questions on that one? So toes, in and out, front and back. Okay? Um, stand up, grab your ball. So part of the footsie during the day, um, kicking your shoes off is a really great idea to maximize that time in natural foot position. If you're, if, let's say you have shoes that don't allow for correct toes, but you know you're going to be doing emails for the next half hour, that might be a great time to get, build that time in our natural foot position over the course of the day. We're trying to optimize that. This, uh, this, ball, this uh, ball just behind the balls of the, the, balls of the feet, or where we want it, not on the balls of the feet, but just behind them, feeling that little arch. Um, and kind of allowing that to lift up and thinking of your foot spreading that way. The ballet stretch helps it stretch this way. I kind of think of this as helping the fascia across the top of the foot spread that way. This is an exaggerated metatarsal pad, obviously, um, and the metatarsal pad allows you to do, with each step, 
making sure you don't drop into a position that's not quite as natural. Um, while you're in this position, you can play with having some active contraction in that position from the ends of the toes. Just hold that position, lean on it, and then just kind of adding that contraction. And you can think of almost like if I wanted to grab this thing with my arch and pick it up rather than just my toes, but <laughs> you'll actually feel a band of muscle tighten that pushes you away from the ball a little bit. You can add that in since you already want to spend five plus minutes a day um, doing your ballet stretch and five plus minutes a day doing this. Once you're here, massage is always nice, so you can go around and do all this stuff. That's all good, but the same rules can apply whether or not you want to get on an area is that that toe flex? Oh, yeah, there it is. You can work it like that, too. Okay, does that make sense? These are just ways that you can kind of, you can kind of be a little bit more specific and a little bit more accurate for what your body is telling you it kind of needs on your, on your journey here um, to being able to run more pain-free. Cool. Does everybody have a ball like this? Does anybody? So at work, there's, getting a tennis ball will work. A lacrosse ball works great. But really, there's almost... No reason not to have one underneath your desk. <laughs> and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right, cool. That's it. Um, so I know there's a lot of listening. Hopefully, you can integrate some of this stuff into, into what you're doing to help increase your recovery time and, and, and accelerate this process a little bit. I love, love running. I love running. I love, love running. I love running. I love running.